Fulbright is a foundation based in Arkansas, which provides programs for scholars from around the world to contribute to a diverse range of academic experiences, both their own and those of a hosting institution. For many years, my university has taken part in one of the Fulbright programs by inviting scholars qualified in English language and related fields to spend a year with us, teaching their native languages, and studying American culture in the classes we offer. We regularly host bright young adventurers from Mexico and Spain, Argentina, and other Spanish speaking countries as Spanish instructors. And we've also hosted several native French speakers to assist with our French instruction as well. This year, University of Arkansas at Monticello has engaged with another of Fulbright's programs, the Fulbright Scholar in Residence, which is designed to enhance internationalization efforts and host campuses. Universities are encouraged to request scholars who would be able to teach courses, assist in curriculum development, guest lecture, develop study abroad exchange partnerships, and engage with campuses and local communities. My vision was to find a scholar who could fill a gap in my own department, English. My university has a fairly solid undergraduate and graduate program in creative writing, but we lack the ability to offer a study of playwriting. If we could find a theoretical Fulbright playwright who, by any chance, had heard of John Ruskin, then my dreams might come true. So when my administration proposed the idea of hosting uh, an SIR, they contacted faculty from every department on campus for input. And many of the faculty who they con uh, contacted seemed generally receptive to move forward with the idea, but no one had any thoughts. How to do that, how to apply for the opportunity that offered. The SIR program is competitive and it's designed to promote cultural and intellectual diversity among the scholar, the institution, and the wider community, which rural Southeast Arkansas desperately needs. The best chance of being selected to host an SIR comes from a university that can identify a scholar willing to spend a semester or a year in residence. My colleagues, seem to lack the international connections to identify such a profession. Perhaps I'm the only one here who waits for others to respond before I commit myself to act, but I kept waiting for someone more important than me to claim the right to name the scholar. When the deadline was short, I feared that my university might actually miss out on an experience which would benefit our institution and our students in ways that I felt were too profound to forego. I knew that through the Friends of Grant Road, the Guild of St. George and the Ruskin Society, I had British and indeed worldwide connections that might yield a chance to identify a scholar willing to act upon our common desire to better the communities and the world in which we live. The thought of making friends with a kindred or skinny was enticing. I often feel like a long voice crying in the wilderness when I teach my students about risk. I indicated to my administrators my willingness to propose the adventure to Ruskin Connections and was urged to do so with all haste. An email conversation which began with Guildmaster Rachel Dickinson resulted in a request that I write a brief note about the possibility for Simon Sullivan to include in the next Gilby newsletter. So this note appeared in the Guild Newsletter Bulletin of April 2022 under this title, A Fulbright Scholarship Opportunity at the University of Arkansas. Notice that Simon left off the at Monticello part, as if he were suggesting the opportunity might be available at Arkansas's flagship institution five hours away in a city whose university has a larger population than my entire town. At least in the fine print, he got the details correct. The University of Arkansas at Monticello is planning, he said, now note the optimism. Um, I'm claiming that our initial explorations are a plan. Um, so we're planning, I thought it might pay to be confident, but we're planning to host a Fulbright Scholar in Residence in Southern Arkansas, United States for either one or two semesters 
during the 2023-24 academic school year. The time frame for the university to complete the application for this opportunity is very close. Guild companions currently working in academia who are interested in this idea should make immediate contact with Dr. K. Walter Biden. The very next morning, I had a query reply from companion Sarah Woods. In response, she said, oh, "I okay. I saw a note about this on the Guild of St. George newsletter. I'm an associate professor at the Denmark National School of Performing Arts, where I co-lead the MFA in performing arts. I'm based in the UK. I work and teach a lot with the ideas of John Ruskin and William Morris and have given lectures on John Ruskin for the Guild, among others. And I also delivered the 2018 Kelpscott Lecture. I'm also a playwright <laughs> and an activist, currently working with the Welsh National Opera, and I'm dramatizing the classic Limits to Growth report for BBC Radio 4. I'd be very interested in finding out more about your vision for this to see if we share any inspiring and creative ideas. The best wishes, Sarah. All I could say in response is thank God for answered prayer. I shared the email with my administrator and his enthusiastic and encouraging reaction urged me to pitch in wholeheartedly to help the cause. I connected Sarah with my administrator and indicated my own willingness to help facilitate communication between them. Within a few conversations, my administrator and I were proposing contributions Sarah could make to our university and community as if the details were settled so as to determine whether or not Fulbright would look positively upon our request in their competition. The three of us agreed that Sarah could teach some sort of playwriting class, as well as a course in her own field of research, systems thinking. The deadline for the application is less than a month away at this point, as the app application competition closed on 1st of June. It was a scramble to get all the necessary paperwork and supporting letters together, and I was very imaginative, creative, maybe, in proposing opportunities for community outreach, which would fulfill the full right role. The community, through the institution, provides the visiting scholar with opportunities to participate in speaking engagements, community meetings, and other grassroots activities. As a member of our local Extension Homemakers Clubs, I even asked our Extension agent for a support letter for the application. She promised to sign one if I would write it. In due course, Fulbright approved and Sarah Woods became our scholar in residence. On 21 August, she flew from England via a tight connection in Chicago to a steaming Arkansas when evening temperatures barely dipped below triple digits. I collected her at the Little Rock Air, uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton Airport, only to discover that while she had arrived fairly intact, her suitcase had not. A small case of winter clothes made the connecting flight with her from Chicago, but her large suitcase was not on the plane. It had been sent to Dallas, Texas for that rerouting. We gave the airline my phone number and were assured that the suitcase would arrive the next day, which it did, though not in time for the first class Sarah had to teach. Luckily, though, it showed up by the day's end intact and delivered with the cheerful smile, which Sarah assures me she is finding to be an unexpected more common among American readers. Since that day, the duties of our semester have been piling up. The courses Sarah designed to teach her well on her way. Systems thinking and the play is system. She has visited at Town and Country Quilters Extension Homemakers Club Workday, Monticello Coffee Company, and community conversations among church groups in our area. We've navigated complex travel arrangements, and Sarah has taken the current opportunity to meet with faculty and students at University of California, Riverside, and University of Southern California. In addition to taping a conversation in Berkeley, during which a prominent systems thinker answered questions posed by her own students in Arkansas. He's the author of much of the assigned reading for that course. Sarah and I have also been working on travel arrangements, which will enable her to speak to more local universities, such as University of Arkansas, Fort Smith, Arkansas State University, and Arkansas State University, Newport. Further, 
Arrangements are underway to enable her to visit and present at Roycroft campus in New York. Having a Ruskinian on hand has richly benefited my life, my university, and our students. Now, when I teach my students about Ruskin and his ideas, the master is not simply another Victorian writer long dead that they never heard of. Suddenly, he is the basis of a visiting international scholar's teaching philosophy. Another voice has joined my own in evangelizing Ruskin in rural Arkansas. That gives the lessons in my classes credence for the students, and it becomes easier for them to see Ruskin's practical application in their own studies and our contemporary world. Most of all, though, my vision of a Fulbright Scholar in Residence for UAM culminates in the events of this evening. I earnestly wanted my university to share the rich benefits of considering Ruskin in our journey to, to secure a Fulbright grant with the Ruskin Work Club. Sarah Woods is not only an excellent scholar and representative of applying Ruskin studies to teaching, writing, researching, thinking, and living. She is an award-winning writer and systems thinker. She's currently a visiting researcher at the Center for Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge, where she's working on the project People and Patterns, transforming the ways we think and connect when everything is at risk. With Emily Lethbridge, she has just been awarded a three-year Icelandic research grant to study women in Icelandic saga landscapes. She's a founder of Artists in Exile, supporting artists to find refuge in the UK. She's currently writing Sanctuary, a new musical about refuge church and state for Red Ladder Theater Company, and her reimagining of Tocqueville's democracy was just named BBC Radio 4 Drama of the Week. She is rapidly becoming my indispensable friend. Please join me in welcoming our speaker this evening, Fred Miller. Thank you, Ms. I'm, um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, thanks to Fulbright, to Kay Walter, and to everyone at the University of Arkansas at Monticello where I'm a Fulbright scholar in residence just through to December. Um, to Emily Rapp at the University of California, Riverside, Tyson Gaskill at the University of Southern California, where I've been teaching this week, to Gabriel Myers and the Ruskin Art Club for making this lecture happen tonight, and to Stuart Denver for providing a fantastic venue. Um, I'd also like to thank the Guild of St George, who in 2020 gave me a small companion grant um, to explore the elements of drawing. John Ruskin's book about how to draw as a series of lessons for life. A lot of what I've been exploring and teaching is about seeing into or through, enabling us to think and work in ways that foreground connection and relationship, creativity and emergence. The ways in which the parts of a thing relate to the whole, what Rus Ruskin might call the help of everything by everything else and what that means about boundaries and borders and identities, which feel crucial in us facing the current challenges we have as a species living with other species on a finite planet. In the elements of drawing written through the winter of 1856 and first published in 1857, John Ruskin said that the noisy life of modern days is wholly incompatible with any true perception of natural beauty. The inordinate excitement and the pomp of daily life and felt can skew your senses and make you enjoy coarse colours and affected forms. Despite the elements of drawing being a book about how to draw, Ruskin believed that this truth of perception or seeing truly was a more important thing than drawing saying that he'd rather teach drawing that my pupils may learn to love nature than teach them looking at nature that they may learn to draw. And that's been my starting point, what nature can teach us, not just about drawing, but about the basic patterns of all life, our own included. How, by beginning to truly see the deeper patterns in stones, trees, landscapes, and life processes, 
we can begin to trace those patterns in our lives, solid and fluid in so many ways. Early on in the elements drawing, Ruskin says, I'm nearly convinced that when once we see keenly enough, there's very little difficulty in drawing what we see. For Ruskin, the whole technical power of painting or really any endeavor in which we might be engaged depends on our recovery of what may be called the innocent of the eye. That is to say, of a sort of childish perception. A, a year or two ago, I did um, a podcast with Harriet Harris, who's the chaplain of Edinburgh University and an old friend of mine from primary school. And she said that this reminded her of the beginner's mind in Zen Buddhism, of which the Zen Buddhist monk Shinro Suzuki says in the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, which is a transcription of one of his talks. The mind of the beginner is empty, free of the habits of the expert, ready to accept, to doubt, and open to all the possibilities. It's a kind of mind which can see things as they are, which step by step and in a flash can realize the original nature of everything. He goes on, in the beginner's mind, there is no thought, I have attained something. All self-centered thoughts limit our vast mind. When we have no thought of achievement, no thought of self, we are true beginners. Then we can really learn something. Seeing truly gives us an ability to see things, as Ruskin says, merely as such, without consciousness of what they signify. Reminding us that when grass is lighted strongly by the sun in certain directions, it is turned from green into a peculiar and somewhat dusty looking yellow. But the very few people have any idea that sunlighted grass is yellow. This is a quote that I use a lot, but still, when I was sitting on a bench in the forest at the University of Arkansas at Monticello a few weeks ago, in bright sunlight, I was there for half an hour before I saw truly that the green sunlight trees um, all around me, the leaves were in fact a somewhat dusky looking yellow. And this sort of thing is happening to us all the time. It's what neuroscientists call our priors, the prior knowledge and experience that we bring to any given situation. In this case, the greenness of grass and leaves. It's the idea that to make sense of and to interact with the world, we need information about what's around us, like the size or location of the nearby object. And to manage this, our brain, for example, in our visual system, combines what it doesn't know with our prior knowledge of the environment to give us a representation or a model of the world. So when we enter our living room, we may identify a fast moving black shape as our cat, even though the visual input, input was only a dark blur disappearing behind the sofa. The actual sensory input was minimal and our prior knowledge did all of the creative work. So the brain fills in the blanks, ignoring things that don't quite add up, editing the world to fit with what we expect. So we bring our priors with us. We see what we think is there before we're even aware of what we've cho chosen to rule in and to rule out. This is called the predictive brain. And Paul Fletcher, a neuroscientist who I've worked with, um, who's from the University of Cambridge, he focuses mainly on delusion, both clinically with patients and also in his research. And he says, having a predictive brain is very useful. It makes us efficient and adept at creating a coherent picture of an ambiguous and complex world. But it also means that we're not very far away from perceiving things that aren't actually there, which is the definition of a hallucination. In recent years, we've come to realize that such altered perceptual experiences are by no means restricted to people with mental illnesses. They're relatively common. In a milder form across the entire population, many of us will have heard or seen things that aren't there. And as we strive to make sense of complex, incoming, often ambiguous information, so we simplify. And that simplification is important. We can't possibly take in all of everything all of the time. 
but it comes with all sorts of risks as we see what we expect to see and not what's really there. A good example of this is the story of the earliest zoo population of penguins, which was established at Edinburgh Zoo in the UK in 1913, which Elliot Schreffer writes about in his brilliant book, Queer Dogs. Because it's very difficult to sex a penguin, the workers at the zoo decided who was male and who was female based on their behavior. As Elliot says, if two of them were a couple, they were like, okay, one of them's male, one of them's female. If one of them's more aggressive, oh, it's probably a male penguin. If one of them was brooding, oh, that must be a female. <laughs> but a few years later, they had to announce that they got the gender identities of the penguins wrong in all but one case. Adam became Abigail. Bertrand became Bertha. Charles became Catherine. There was a male-male couple and a female-female. Dora was the only penguin to remain Dora. It was only in 2010, when a study of wild-born penguins was done in Denmark, that the discovery was made that 28% of courting rituals the penguins displayed were between same-sex penguins. We see what we expect to see, and sometimes, perhaps, what it's easier for us to see. And in so doing, we create and recreate our world. The same sorts of things are happening when we look at the stories that we're telling ourselves. Human beings are story-making creatures. It's how we make sense of the world. Philip Pullman, the author of His Dark Materials, says that after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. And we often think about story in the singular, the story comes from lots of different places. Often we're less aware of them and the power that they have than we might be because they're so much part of the fabric of our lives. We all carry with us an inner storyscape, stories we tell ourselves to make sense of our lives, about who we are and what's happening to us. Some of them we're aware of, some of them are more unconscious and automatic. They affect how we see ourselves and what we feel we can do in the world, which Augusto Boal, the Brazilian theatre maker, calls having cops in the head, a sort of internalization of the, of the oppressions of society, the society that we're in. We also share stories with our friends, our family, and communities that shape our worldview and how we feel about our lives and the lives of others. I recently dramatized, as Kay mentioned, Tocqueville's Democ Democracy in America for BBC Radio 4. And Tocqueville, as you probably know, was a French aristocrat whose parents nearly got their heads chopped off during the French Revolution. And he went to America in 1831 when he was 25 to find out more about democracy because he, would, he believed, as it did, that it would soon come to Europe. And one of the things he noticed about the US at that time was how as people got busier with the making of money, they had less time and interest for other things like philosophy and literature and religion and public and political duty. And he warned that this could bring about a turning inwards or individualism, where everyone sought their opinions within themselves or their immediate friends and family, or from a newspaper, or we might say from social media, which can drop the same thought into a thousand minds at the same moment. In terms of the stories we're telling each other at present, it certainly feels like we didn't really heed Tocqueville's warning. How often do we hear or read these stories merely as such, without consciousness of what they signify? In addition to the stories we share with those closest to us, we're told stories by all sorts of agencies, the media, political parties, charities, and co corporations. These stories gain dominance in society taking up space, denying space to other stories, and they're often so normalized, we don't even see them. To continue Boal's metaphor, there are cops in our heads, but their headquarters are outside. And we carry stories from our cultural upbringings too, myths, legends, religious stories, and folk tales. We also tell stories about the future. Just before the pandemic, I took a group of Danish master's students to visit the Swedish Institute for Children's Books in Stockholm. 
And each year they review all of the children's and young adult fiction that's been either written in Swedish or um, translated into Swedish. And I asked the librarian whether I was right in thinking that my children, who'd grown up over the previous 20 years, had had a diet of stories that were largely apocalyptic and dystopian. And she said, yeah, that had been their findings until the previous year, when another theme had started to emerge in children's literature, that of a stranger arriving in a foreign land and being cared for. With stories coming from all of these different places, there are always a number of narratives playing out and intersecting for us. But we're not as aware of them and their power as we might be because we live in them. So it's hard to see them objectively. And we can think of these stories as mindsets or paradigms out of which our reality grows, what we eat, the hours we work, who we think is worth more and who we think is worth less. These stories are an expression of the paradigm we live in, the shared ideas that society holds, big, often unstated beliefs about how the world works. Unstated because it isn't necessary to state them, because everyone already knows them. All of us can become entrenched in paradigms, even without knowing we are. And to manage this, Donella Meadows, the wonderful systems thinker and lead author of the Limits to Growth Report, which was published 50 years ago now, we haven't really um, learned that lesson either, says that in order to better understand the paradigm we're in, we need to firstly get outside of that paradigm so we can see it more clearly and ideally not be looking at it from within another paradigm, which is kind of impossible but worth a good try. In many of our areas of our lives, it, 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 it's just difficult. It's difficult to discern what's us and what are the, the paradigms and stories that, that we've been living with. But if we practice it as Ruskin suggests in the natural world, I think it can be really helpful in developing that habit of seeing truly, getting us as close to seeing things from outside of the paradigm or paradigms in which we live our lives as we can manage. So that when we do something, we do it particularly. And remember, as Ruskin says, to resolve always as you look at the thing, what you will take and what miss of it. Only remember this, there is no general way of doing it. No recipe can be given you for so much as the drawing of a cluster of grass. The grass may be ragged and stiff or tender and flowing, sunburned and sheep bitten or rank and languid, fresh or dry, lustrous or dull to look at. Try to draw it as it is and don't think how somebody told you to do grass. So a stone may be round or angry, polished or rough, cracked all over like an ill-blazed teacup, or as united and broad as the breast of Hercules. It may be as flaky as a wafer, as powdery as a field puffball. It may be knotted like a ship's hawser, or kneaded like hammered iron, or knit like a Damascus sable, or fused like a glass bottle, or crystallized like hoarfrost or vein, like a forest leaf. Look at it. And don't try to remember how anybody told you to do a stone. We might practice this ourselves by picking up a stone and giving it our attention, or by going outside and looking at the same tree or plant every day, noticing it, truly seeing it. May Morris, William and James, Jane Morris's younger daughter, said that her father designed 45 wallpapers and six theme papers, all of them featured the natural world. Branches, vines, fruits, flowers, birds, and animals. Morris's study of nature often took place out in the field, and writing about his wallpaper willow boughs in her memoirs, May says that her and her father were walking one day by our little stream that runs into the Thames, and my father pointed out the detail, and soon after, the paper was done. These influences, as with all of our influences, travel through Morris's life, re-emerging in textiles, in tiles, in wallpapers, and in the way that he sees the world. <coughs> Willow trails through Morris's designs, from Willow in 1874, the background of Lily in 1873, and Powdered in 1874, to Willow Bows in 1887, 
branch in the background scroll, so you share the same pattern of leaves branching from a single stem. The background pattern for lily has since been used as a pattern of its own for wallpaper and textiles. This act of seeing truly is also a way of learning because as the predictive brain theory teaches us, the only time we really learn is when we get a prediction error. When we're not sure it's the cat disappearing behind the sofa, that's where we find our opportunity to see the world afresh. And we might then be moved to turn this innocence of the eye into a drawing or a wallpaper or a fabric design. And we might also be moved to think about what these patterns tell us about our world. As the great systems thinker Fritjof Kapler tells us, throughout history, Western societies have given more attention to elements than to interconnections, tending to think more mechanistically than holistically, asking what is it made of rather than what is the pattern. Sometimes, however, as he identifies, the study of pattern and relationship comes to the fore. And now in our networked digital world, as we wrestle with systemic problems, is one of those times. And he continues, as the 21st century unfolds, it's becoming more and more evident that the major problems of our time, energy, the environment, climate change, food security, financial security, cannot be understood in isolation. They're systemic problems, which means that they're all interconnected and interdependent. Developing these sorts of habits can also help us to increase our inner ability to manage complexity. As Lena Rachel Anderson and Thomas Bjorkman write in The Nordic Secret, a high level of complexity of mind is what allows meaning making at a higher level of complexity, and it allows us to understand our society and to navigate it. The more complex our inner world is, the better it matches and can handle the outer world. Especially as the outer world becomes more complex, we can engage with more situations and challenges in more meaningful ways. As Kay mentioned, I'm teaching systems thinking to a brilliant group of undergraduate students um, at the University of Arkansas at Monticello this semester. And the class is really diverse, including a 19-year-old white woman on a cheerleading scholarship and a 73-year-old Black retired school psychologist. As we explore systems thinking week by week and the patterns they reveal, so the students identify patterns in their own lives. Arlie Beth, the cheerleading uh, student, talks about how a cheerleading routine is also a pattern, behaving the same way that a murmuration of birds does. And Sam, the retired school psychologist, talks about hearing Martin Luther King give his speech during the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, a speech about freedom and equality arising from a land of slavery and hatred. And hearing it, Sam, a 13-year-old black boy, told himself, when I'm grown up, I will be in the new America. Five years later, in the fall of 1967, he enrolled of Pontotoc High School as the first and only black student. One of the ways in which Ruskin identifies this pattern language is in what he calls the fateful or governing lines of something, which he says are expressive of the past history and present action of the thing. We can see this vital truth, these lines, he says, in a mountain or a tree or a wave or a cloud, and finding them enables us to find, as Ruskin says, the change or changing in them. The animal in its motion, the tree in its growth, the cloud in its course, the mountain in its wearing away. Try always, he says, whenever you look at a form, to see the lines in it which have had power over its past fate and will have power over its futurity. These are its awful lines. See that you seize on those, whatever else you miss. They show in a mountain, first how it was built or heaped up, and secondly, how it's now being worn away, and from what quarter the wildest storms will strike it. In a tree, they show what kind of fortune it's had to endure from its childhood, 
how troublesome trees have come in its way and pushed it aside and tried to strangle or starve it. Where and when kind trees have sheltered it and grown up lovingly together with it, bending as it bent. What winds torment it most, what boughs of it behave best and bear most fruit. In a wave or cloud, these leading lines show the run of the tide and of the wind and the sort of change which the water or vapour is at any moment enduring in its form as it meets shore or counterweight or melting sunshine. Knowing the way things are going, Austin says, is the thing that distinguishes wisdom from stupidity. Your dunce, he says, thinks they are standing still and draws them all fixed. Your wise man sees the change or changing in them and draws them so, which is a challenge to all of them. The poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, who studied and wrote about Ruskin when he was a student at Oxford, wrote in his journal that what you look hard at seems to look hard at you. He de developed the term instate, which is the thing that makes the thing itself and not something else. It's essential character. And he described it as held together by an energy he called instress. And he also created the verb to sell, to express the object's continual act of being in itself, which he touches on in his poem as Kingfisher's Cat Fire. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors, each one dwells, selves, goes itself, myself, it speaks and spells, crying, what I do is for me, for that, I can. Ruskin says that while these lines of indicative action are not always easy to spot, with a little attention, you can see such lines in everything. These lines revealing change, motion, and growth are also signs of imperfection, a theme that Ruskin developed in The Nature of Gothic, saying, no architecture can be truly noble which is not imperfect. The imperfect and the unfinished are places of possibility, places still on a journey, still somehow alive in that process of change common to all of us and to everything. We might say that the difference between an organism that is alive and one that is dead is that breath of life, the, sleep, the ceaseless flow of energy and matter through a network of chemical reactions which enables a living organism to continually generate, repair, and perpetuate itself. Another name for that is metabolism. A metabolism has two basic aspects. One is the continuous flow of energy and matter that we've mentioned. Living systems are open systems, continually taking in food and producing waste. In other words, a living system operates far from equilibrium. Matter continually flows through it, and yet the system maintains a stable form. To visualize this non-equilibrium state, we can think of a vortex, for example, a whirlpool in a bathtub. Water continually flows into and out of the vortex, yet its characteristic shape remains stable. Metaphorically, we can visualize a living, living organism as a whirlpool, a stable structure with matter and energy always moving through it. As Ruskin says in The Stones of Venice, imperfection is in some sort essential to all that we know of life. It's the sign of life in a mortal body. That is to say, a state of progress of change. Nothing that lives is or can be rigidly perfect. Part of it is decaying, part nascent. The foxglove blossom, a third part bud, a third part past, a third part in full bloom is a type of the life of this world. Mm -hmm. And in all things that live, there are certain irregularities and deficiencies, which are not only signs of life, but sources of beauty. All admit oh. irregularity as they imply change. And to banish imperfection is to destroy expression, to check yes. exertion, to paralyze vitality. Yes. Everything is in flux. We like to think and we strive to be in a steady state, but our bodies tell us in their most basic systemic responses that we're always in a state of flux. And this fluidity and flow is everywhere. 
the cell, the smallest system of life found in all living things, is bounded by a semi-permeable membrane, as you probably know from your biology class. And that semi-permeable membrane is always participating in the activity of the cell, which we found out to our posture in the pandemic, letting things in and out. And without that flow, it ceases to exist. As Richard Capra says, boundaries in the realm of the living are not boundaries of separation, but of identity. There's constant interaction with the environment. But despite this obvious fluidity, we tend to talk and try to live as if the borders and boundaries between things are solid. The border between Russia and Ukraine, for example. At the start of the UK Ukraine war, again, as Kay mentioned, I set up a small not-for-profit com company supporting Ukrainian artists to come to the UK. And I quickly learned that there are Ukrainians on the Russian side, of course, and Russians on the Ukrainian side, and families that straddle that border. And this pattern, of identity and relationship and connection, which is at the heart of our cellular lives, is also at the heart of how we connect with ideas and people and events. So what do we mean by identity? What is my identity? The social psychologists Michael Hart and Dominic Abrams define identity as people's concepts of who they are, what sort of people they are, and how they relate to others. Well, for the politician and diplomat, Francis Deng, it's the way individuals and groups define themselves and are defined by others on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, language, and culture. The political scientist, Peter Katzenstein, talks about mutually constructed and evolving images of self and other. Sociologists Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman say that identity is objectively defined as location in a certain world and can be subjectively appropriated only along with that world. Whereas for the cultural theorist Stuart Hall, it's a kind of unsettled space or an unresolved question in that space between a number of intersecting discourses rather than a fixed point of thought and being sorry, rather than a fixed point of thought and being, or a ground of action, Paul says that identity is a process. Identity is not a fixed point, but an ambivalent point. Identity is also the relationship of other to oneself. So identity is as much about the other as it is about self, about relationship and evolution. It's a ground of action between intersecting discourses. And often when we talk about how life on Earth began, we talk about the idea of a primordial soup. And somehow, out of this soup comes life. And what people are now thinking happened in that soup is not dissimilar to the thought processes that give rise to our ideas and our inspirations. And that's the notion that were, the, that were these proto-cells, primitive bubbles or vesicles bounded by a membrane of grease which may have formed spontaneously in the primeval oceans and in which complexity developed as elements bounced off each other intensely, making rare events much more common and evolving into the first living cells. William Morris refers to something similar in his lecture, Some Hints on Pattern Designing, which he gave on December the 10th, 1881. For Morris, ornamental pattern work must have three qualities, beauty, imagination and order. And of order, he says, I have to say of it, that without it, neither the beauty nor the imagination could be made visible. It is the bond of their life and as good as creates them. It both builds a wall against vagueness and opens a door therein for imagination to come in life. This idea of a bounded space that better enables things to bound off, bounce off each other is at the heart of improvisation and many forms of art and debate, debate. The structure, the boundaries, create a space in which we can be free. As Fritjof says, substances created rarely in an unstructured environment can be created regularly in these bubbles. Inside them, their complexity increases until they sometimes burst into smaller bubbles. And he says that while mutation and natural selection are important to biological evolution, the central focus is on creativity. 
Keith Johnson, who wrote the book Impro about um, the art of improvisation, says something similar. For him, being original is not about jamming things together, you know, all sorts of different things. It's about working within limits. And the stronger those limits, the more profound the originality. In The Law of Help, in um, Modern Painters volume, volume 5, which Gabriel has um, kindly been discussing with me, Ruskin defines composition as the help of everything in the picture by everything else. Inanimate objects like clouds and stones are different. Their atoms may cohere or consist with each other, but the taking away of one part doesn't injure the rest. Whereas in a plant, the taking away of any one part does injure the rest. If any part enters into a state in which it no more assists the rest and has thus become helpless, we also call it dead. The power which causes the several portions of the plant to help each other, we call life. A pure or holy state of anything, therefore, is that in which all its parts are helpful or consistent. They may or may not be homogenous. The highest and first law of the universe and the other name of life is therefore hell. The other name of death is separation. Government and cooperation are in all things and eternally the laws of life. Anarchy and competition eternally and in all things the laws of death. And he applies these ideas of creativity and wholeness to human labour too, saying that products that are the result of healthy and ennobling labour are recognised by the observance of three, three is always a good number, broad and simple rules. The first being never encourage the manufacture of any article not absolutely necessary in the production of which invention has no share. Continuing that the cutting of precious stones requires little exertion of any mental faculty, some tact and judgment in avoiding flaws, but nothing to bring out the whole mind. Every person who wears cut jewels merely for the sake of their value is therefore a slave driver. It sounds stern, but I agree. Creativity is a process by which a number of distinct ideas or elements are connected into a whole. And it's also a process which, as Ruskin points out, brings out the whole mind. He refers to this process in the nature of Gothic, saying, you must either make a tool of the creature or a man, we, we might quibble with his use of gender, but I'll go with it, or a man of him. You cannot make both. He continues, it's not truly speaking the labour that is divided but the men, divided into mere segments of men, broken into small fragments and crumbs of life, so that all the little piece of intelligence that is left in a man is not enough to make a pin or a name, but exhausts itself in making the point of a pin or the head of a nail. And similarly, Tocqueville noted that when a workman has spent a considerable portion of his existence in this manner, his thoughts are forever set upon the object of his daily toil. His body has certain fixed habits. In a word, he no longer belongs to himself but to the work he has chosen, or perhaps hasn't chosen. Earlier this year, I spoke to Joanne Glogger, the keeper of collections at um, the Redditch Needle Museum in the UK. And in the Victorian period, 90% of the world's needles came from Redditch. And she told me a story about a visitor who was being shown around one of the needle factories um, and seeing a workman who appeared to be stationary. But he wasn't stationary. He was kick-stamping the impression of the eye of the needle into repeated needles and um, so where the eye was going to go. And he was doing it so fast that he appeared to be stationary. As Tocqueville says, well, democracy seems to open a thousand different paths to fortune. Manufactured binds him to a craft and frequently to a spot, which he cannot leave. It gives him a certain place in society beyond which he cannot go. And in the midst of universal movement, it renders him stationary. We only have to look at nature and the processes at the very heart of all life to see what constitutes life and death, to see that the parts 
are more than the sum of them all. And because we've been reading these patterns all of our lives, they are in us. They are us. As Ruskin says, again in the elements of drawing, nature is all made up of roundnesses, boughs, our rounded leaves, our rounded stones, our rounded clouds, our rounded cheeks, are rounded and curls around it. There is no more flatness in the natural world than there is vacancy. The world itself is round, and so is all that is in it, more or less, except human work, which is often very flat indeed. When I visited Karen Povero, who's the archivist at the Style Library, which is the home of Morris and Co., we talked about why Morris's patterns endure, and the idea that it's perhaps at least partly to do with us knowing them. In 2002, when he was United States Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, in response to a question about the lack of evidence linking the Iraqi government with the supply of weapons of mass destruction, the terrorist group said, as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. <laughs> but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> and I'd argue, he'd recently been to a, a NASA presentation, and that was his uh, paraphrasing of the NASA pre uh, presentation. Um, and I'd argue that there's another class, which is unknown knowns. Things we know, but don't always consciously know we know. It's not the same as having forgotten. It's stuff we know in our bones. And it borders on double things sometimes, when the knowing starts to surface. And I think this is one of the reasons that we return to Morris's patterns and also to Ruskin's ideas, because we've been reading patterns all of our lives. They are us. And all of our patterns are of the world, of plants and animals and buildings and furnishings that have been designed often with nature in mind. Like Morris, nature seems to know the relationship between beauty, imagination, and order. And while the natural world appears to champion difference, its patterns are surprisingly limited. It's not just trees and leaves that have branches. Rivers do too. An underground train system transport passengers using the same branching pattern that their vessels use to transport blood. The turbulence we see when we pour cream into a cup of coffee is there in swirls of smoke rising from the fire. A fern head unfolds like water spiraling down a pile. For pattern, there's no division between the living and the non-living, between the waves of the zebra stripes and sand blown across the beach. The plates on the shell of a tortoise join like bubbles in a cluster. Mud at the bottom of a dried up pond and the glaze on a ceramic plate share and cracking. The three-way joints in the wrinkles on the surface of our brains are inversions of those on the ridged skin of a dry pea. Water flows like hair, falling and curling, and wood flows too, along patterns of stress. As Peter S. Stevens, the author of the fourth of Patterns in Nature says, the new water chases out the old, but the pattern remains the same. And while we may not have noticed these things, when we stop and think, when we stop and truly see, we know these things feel right, they satisfy us. We can learn, just as Ruskin learned, that these patterns are everywhere, if only we will see. In 1841, Ruskin wrote a letter to his friend, Edward Clayton, saying, Time was when I began drawing that I used to think a picturesque or beautiful tree was hardly to be met with once a month. I cared for nothing but oaks a thousand years old, split by lightning or shattered by wind. Now there's not a twig in the closest clipped hedge that grows that I cannot admire and wonder at and take pleasure in and learn from. It might be a good start. If we could do the same. Thank you.
Thank you so much, sir. That was wonderful. Um, I would like to open the discussion now to conversation, maybe some questions. The concern could maybe want to. Uh, we'll sit down to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little more yeah. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Let me say to the Zoom uh, audience too that if you uh, will put um, comments in chat, uh, then I can convey those uh, to, uh, to Sarah as well. So I'll, I'll open the conversation. I'm, I'm really um, fascinated with this idea of getting outside where you are to see what you see. And I wonder if, if maybe um, that's not true culturally as well. If, if maybe you had a view of the United States that now you've stepped outside of by stepping into that maybe you could share with us that we help us step outside of, of the environment. It's interesting. I think um, certainly the southern states of America, um, people have a very limited view of generally. Obviously, just, there are lots of people in the UK who lived or have been there. But generally speaking, when I said that I was going to Arkansas, people were a, afraid I was going to immediately get shot and had the idea just that it would be just everyone was a redneck in a truck with a big gun on the back. Um, so I think it's there's something about how we reduce things down to a singularity, which is, it happens to William Morris, that he was saying, oh, he's such a bunch of contradictions. And you think, well, no, he's just a person who lived a life. <laughs> like all of us went through various stages and changes. So I think we, um, in the UK, often reduce um, the United States down to, in quite reductive ways. Um, not everybody, but I think there's a sense that lots of, um, lots of what's bad uh, has come from or is situated in um, the United States that there's, you know, that it's a sort of a, a, a big brother character who's, um, who's influencing us. Obviously, um, that's a very reductive way to look at it, but I'd say that, is, that there is that view alongside, you know, us watching so many um, series and films and, you know, and really loving all that comes out, I think, um, creatively from the US. Um, for myself, I've been really blown away by people's generosity, people's kindness. In the UK, people have quite often sort of the, the, the sort of have a nice day phrase has been seen as something um, quite hollow, really, that is, isn't known. And my experience has been that people really mean that when they say that, you know, and that I, you know, there's a, there's a real warmth in people's engagement with each other. I think people in the UK are polite to each other, but uh, are a little more um, aloof, whereas there seems to be a real genuine emotional warmth um, in people. Um, yeah. in, in, you know, in, obviously, I have been everywhere in various parts of the US. And I think the South is particular in that there's, um, there's an enormous warmth in people, which, um, which sort of confounds, I think, the, perhaps the UK rather narrow view of it. Okay, thank you. Someone else, a question? Well, in relation to what you talked about and what you just said, um, thinking about predictive nature and how we that interacts with, you know, sort of the ongoing, um, let's say, more fluid changing aspect of whether it's, it's, um, what you come in contact with socially or culturally or otherwise, or even in families, you know. And um, my feeling is that all identity is is possible fluid because of that nature of that, um, you know, even though we have we set down, let's say, some stones before us that we walk upon that are familiar to us. It's it's always the unfamiliar, and in screenwriting, you know, they often say that it is, um, it is the the, the stumbling blocks that really create a you know a strong character. So, in just thinking about any art um, that we use to express um, the the best and the worst of humanity, I I I love that this idea sort of applies to 
to all of the arts, um, whether it's you know drawing or painting or um, poetry, screenwriting, um, maybe, and even even uh, scientific investigation. That's an ongoing process, the way that our bodies are ongoing changing process. And so I, I love I love that idea. And I think that if people embrace that a little more, that it would help with our encountering the unknown and encountering different types of people and you know all of those things. So so I'm really grateful for this talk. I think it's it's quite amazing how I revisited it and never recorded it. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And I think perhaps there's something in the anxiety and the fear that that's rising, I think, in all sorts of different parts of the world. Um, and the reactions that then that creates, the, the ways that we might behave or vote, um, that I think there's something about accepting uncertainty and humility that can, can perhaps help with that. I happened to see a, uh, a video, a brief video interview with Nanny and all over me, which is interesting, second quality, the second purpose. Um, interestingly enough, his daughter worked for me many, many years ago, and so we had kind of familial overview and insight into the nature of the man. But he made the point that you're making, a, that Elena, you brought up that anxiety is actually to be welcomed in the creative life. And that is always present in the uh, uh, birth of creative energy. It is a, an inevitable yeah. and necessary component of creativity. Yeah, and um, there's the, the Chinese figure, isn't there, that means both danger and opportunity, which um, Augusto Boal called the Chinese crisis. So, you know, there, there is danger and opportunity. And I think. Um, you know, we've been we've been fed and feeding ourselves stories of apocalypse and um, you know and destruction for the last twenty years. Then we're going to expect there's going to be danger if we can also see, as you say, opportunity, which is the idea of what we might create. Then, then I think that tension becomes useful. And one other uh, sort of fork in the conversation, we're talking about how science uh, seems to be confirming. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, recurrence of patterns, mm -hmm. and it has been an idea I've had even though I've been involved with visual arts uh, and also um, as a writer. Uh, I've followed science as well, and, and it, it's always struck me that you know, we talk about the about what we hear about at least we don't know what we hear about um, the great mystery of dark matter and dark energy, mm -hmm. uh, and it's occurred to me that one of the things that physicists the most theoretical of this mm -hmm. physicists seem not to have taken account of is form. Mm -hmm. As I consider the incredible multiplicity of forms, I've experienced and continue to experience and expect to continue to experience that exists in the world, have existed, will continue. The variegation is so vast mm -hmm. that we've heard the old saw variety is the spice of life. No, variety is the essence of them. And so I wonder that somehow. On the most abstruse level of physics and mm -hmm. thought, whether form could somehow be involved with dark matter, dark energy. That's interesting. I just want yeah. because there's no other accounting for it. No. Physics. No. Now, is form simply the expression of that which is lambent, latent, mm -hmm. in, potential in mm -hmm. the world and the cosmos? Mm -hmm. Is that all of it is? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But Plato certainly saw. Well, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The, and even his notion of the the ultimate forms are separated from us. Yeah. We can know they're there, but we don't have access, yeah. you know, to them. And we see their reflections in patterns that we observe here. And our works with shadows. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The job is to extrapolate. One's way up into that. Invisible sphere. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, I took a drawing course from Joseph Albert, and I, he must have said at least once every class, draw what you see, not what you know. 
And he was forcing us to, and we do this funny thing like bicycling, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it forced us to see when I was growing up, the bicycle, you know, you know, the bicycle, right? Right, and it just had you had that disaggregate your knowledge and see it again. What's the wonderful quote you and I have? Seeing, yeah, the greatest thing a human soul ever does in this world is to see something, yeah. to tell what it saw in a clear way. You see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. Yeah. And light, light, by the way, light, uh, uh, the speed of light is such that in physics, time no longer exists for light. That is to say, when uh, something 65 million light years away bursts and it's like it comes to us, mm -hmm. it comes to us at that very moment somehow. It's, it's, it's a bit of a conundrum. But one of the other things about 60, galaxy 65 million years away um, will just be now seeing, just be now seeing the extermination of the dinosaurs on our planet. Mm. 65 million years ago. Mm. And that is the current idea in physics, isn't it? That, that what we're here to do really is to witness, to see. Yeah, that's right, to see. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to bring it back to this because it's, it's it's very it's very interrelated it's very circular. Um, Kierkegaard said anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. But so in as an artist again, and my father who was a drawing teacher used to say you have to make yourself uncomfortable for a moment to to get out of your habits in order to to re see and to really embody and understand what you're drawing. So he would have his students put on armor when they were drawing a knight in armor. It was very much like like method actor, right? And and, and also pure writing a persona in poetry. Mm. But um but that then relates to Carlo Robelli, the theoretical physicist talking about how that there's, you know, which we've heard before that there's an element of the stars in all of us. That we're carrying the message in the DNA or the you know some of the information and and again if we brought that to the foreground of thinking about ourselves in relation to others and other people and, and that we are already I mean and and we thought that maybe COVID would teach us this that we're that we're you know there are no borders when it comes to certain things like um, climate crisis or or disease. Yet people are afraid of change and they're afraid of, of stepping outside, you know, in out of their familiar. And so it's just, I don't know. I don't know if there's an answer to that or but but just you know, even the smallest of awareness starts to build upon the next awareness. And at least that's our hope, right? That that tension, that point of tension is really the point of growth. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. also the point where you have to be very um, frank about vulnerability, right? You have to you have to recognize and admit your own vulnerability. And that's hard, isn't it, to, to share with others. There's a pervasive conversation that is going on now on the issue of loneliness. This amount of COVID and a lot of things. Um, just in terms of you know the Rustin's making us see and you know how Comforting that is, and how you know when needs not to be removed, but the compile itself, and we need to teach that to each other, and that is a lot of us. And you know, there, there's always a religious comfort around the corner, and how you found this this the story is just um, you know curiosity. You know? And you know, seeking and discovering that we continue to learn our individual needs. We, we have to have hope that we can come to that place where there is goodwill among all of us on the planet. It's not going to happen soon. But the funny thing is that, and I don't know whether this is as clear an analogy as I might make. But uh, uh, the observation of an electron changes the nature of the electron. Uh, the, the, the 
postulating a hope it was uh, intellectual and emotional uh, uh, universe, it seems to me is the only way that hope is going to become a reality. I mean, you have to observe something you want to change with, with the lens of hope if you want the world to become open. Well, that's and that's come a long way on that in that regard, these are good questions. And that's what um, Frederick Polak, who was said to be the first futurist, said after the Second World War, said as, as long as society has a positive vision of the future, then it will flourish. But without that positive vision, then, you know, we're in some trouble. But I think we understand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I just think that I think that going back to what life lessons from us I think one of the keys is that notion of opportunity and danger. Yeah. Because I mean, no one is more apocalyptic than us mm -hmm. about the ecological future. You saw it as early as anyone mm -hmm. and was not optimistic that we would be able to change the patterns that had set that, those destructive elements in motion. At the same time, Ruskin is urging us to embrace our real life, to embrace nature. And then even in that context talks about the challenge of the sufficient life. In other words, I think always the great thing about Ruskin is in the in in even in the recognition of how catastrophic our decisions have been for many centuries, that we can choose. And in choosing, we can choose another way. And in choosing, it changes everything. So, for example, Ruskin's in that very pessimistic period in his end, he begins to talk about the sufficient life, which is to say, learning to inhabit your world, learning to know what you need to do what you need to do and not more, breaking with uh, with acquisitiveness, breaking with the disease that we call it, affluenza, yeah. the need, always the need for more. Uh, well, and, yeah. and, you know, so so I think there's always, with Ruskin, the, the opportunity and the danger. If the danger is great, the opportunity is as well. Right. And that we can never tell what, when you graph out those choices, what will emerge from them. Of course, it's fair to point out, though, for in and make and this is as it was then. Now, for workers and people that are trying to survive, they don't have that that emotional or intellectual space to give themselves in order to do what you're talking about in order to to explore the nature of you know whatever it is that's going to to uh, express a change. And so, and, and of course, the, the culture, for our culture in particular, American culture, fights against that. It's always promoting something larger and, and mm. outreach. And, um, so I, I, you know, and there again, I hope that, um, that the, the vocabulary changes as does the, 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 the cellular, information yeah. of our planet yeah. does. Um, you know, because we know that um, climate change impacts the people who are already most, you know, in unfortunate situations and, and at risk. Um, those are the communities that are first and foremost, we realize, um, yeah. impacted by this climate crisis. Yeah, I, when I was, um, so the version I did with democracy just recently for BBC Radio 4, I took uh, we'd love the second volume, but with some parts of the first volume, um, and chapter by chapter broke it down into questions. And myself and my daughter Lil travelled through the North England down and then across into Wales. And we just took the questions. We'd meet people just by chance. We'd just go up to people and ask if we could talk to them. We met all sorts of people at the motorway service station, truck stops, um, at Gudwara, you know, just all sorts of different places, a car exhaust, garage, and um, and just asked them the questions. And actually, people had a lot to say. People intellectually and emotionally had a depth of understanding, as we all do, about what's happening in life, what they thought about it, what needs to happen. 
But I think the difficulty and the tragedy is that, you know, as one woman beautifully put it, she said, you know, my my life, my my son's life, we're we're pushing water uphill. That's what we're doing. So the daily grind of it mm. um, is so great that you can't actually then get beyond to communicate or to create change around the things that need changing. So that's the you know the, the stationary track that um top will and Ross can in different ways to talk about. Good. Good. Is there one feeling Beverly and I have discussed and I was in a way that we're thrown back on our heels in a sense and forced to do to basically forced to just cons con uh, content ourselves with living an exemplary life. Mm -hmm. Oh, that mm -hmm. our pod, our cell, our cell will mm -hmm. somehow vibrate a little, which is just a little change. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be in the Southwest part mm -hmm. of Arkansas. Yes. Southeast part of Arkansas. You're you're in a very isolated uh, and not very hospitable environment. And you're doing that. You're a, you're a, you're a courageous, mm -hmm. uh, uh, very courageous energy person. You're amazing to do that and to, to do it with such consistency and clarity. Mm -hmm. I congratulate you. And I think that that's a model for us all that we live exemplary lives. Mm -hmm. And trust or hope that what we're doing has some some ramifications as mm -hmm. as an effect. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are obvious ways which we know we can affect change. Mm -hmm. you know, we know there's certain obvious things. Mm -hmm. the, the least obvious thing is to content oneself with one's own yeah. pod. Yeah, yeah. So now well, Meadows yeah. um, in limits growth. I don't know if you've seen that she has like this graph, which is sort of time and space. And she said most people by the second year in his bottom corner thinking about here and now mm. um and just can't get beyond like that like the woman who said i'm spending all my time pushing more drive that's what they're doing and some of us have the liberty in different ways to be further out on the other yeah. towards that yeah. other corner yeah. Yeah. in time and space yeah. that's thinking. our obligation to reduce that yeah. Yeah, just, just quickly. Interestingly, during the depression, though, people would spend money to go to the movies. They knew that they needed that that interaction with with seeing another world, being part of another world, imagining all of those things. So, so films survived during the depression. The refuge. Yeah, there's a kind of reference. Yeah, that, that's all. Yeah, this is back to Sarah's essential point, though, I think, is that the elements of drawing were Ruskin's way of responding to the people who feel that they're pushing water up the you know, it was It was a drop in the bucket, but it was the right drop, which is to say, teaching, drawing to laborers at night. And Ruskin thought what he thought was, if a, if a worker who is experiencing that sense of of uh, you know be making the head of the, the the head of the nail all day long and being dehumanized by the whole process, if at night I can teach him to draw, as he once said to, to Gorbachev, he was uh, that, you know if I teach your workmen to draw. I will teach him. I will teach him to think, <laughs> and I will teach him to 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 become a critical being, and then you're in trouble. Yeah. You know. So so the, that notion that even in that that situation there are ways of freeing up uh, uh, a person's natural uh, uh, ability to sense themselves as a person. Obviously, political context. Uh, we ran a foundation, not a money thing, but an art foundation called mm. Art for Healing. And mm. we did that in San Francisco for almost 30 years. We collected art from the Bank of America and other places and put it into uh, hospitals of all kinds. And the most profound uh, effects uh, on were studied actually by the British on that there, the healing rate was increased by the presence of works of art. And I then thought about it, why is that? It's 
Because works of art are, as it was when he said, imagination, beauty, and the wonder of the presenter, the poet of us. Yeah, was it? Uh, Morris. William Morris. And, and so it's it's the experience, the kind of confrontation, the presence, the living presence, daily presence of the work of art of all that has imagination, beauty, and especially the order. And even the order, the order can be quite uh, violent, you know, it can be very powerful, but order nonetheless. And these dis or, or especially in institutions for mentally disturbed people, mm -hmm. that order becomes order mm -hmm. inevitably. It's, it's almost osmotic. Yeah, exactly. It's a wonderful experience. Any questions from our? Yeah, that's a good one. No, I checked yeah. earlier. I didn't see any, nothing in the chat. Have been abandoned or are they still? We have, um, we have, a, we have a, a couple of people here. Braden, do you have any questions? Hello, I am here. How are you? <laughs> I don't have any questions. I was here for uh, my my statement. My statement is I agree with all the stuff that you were saying. I found it rather interesting. Uh, I'm happy that um, I would have made this one anyways, right? But I'm very glad that I was able to listen to what was being talked about. Thank you. No problem at all. <laughs> I'm interested in people helping me think through the rest of the talk about discipline of seeing. But he was also capable of being a champion of, of Turner, whose works are highly imaginative. So how do you how do you connect the rigor of discipline of seeing and noticing to uh, the the imaginative world that came to like less than Turner to I don't know. I'm having a best place to answer that. Maybe I can have a response. Certainly have a response to that question. Um, for for Ruskin, who's gone off everything as having been optimally perceived as having roundness. Uh, for Ruskin, who thought that the corruptibility of iron uh, in rust was a source of beauty. Uh, for the, the Japanese, who took up Ruskin, embraced him precisely for his uh, understanding of the singularity of forms of life. Every object is unique unto itself when studied or seen. Um, what Turner did was to uh, allow the, the uh, really essentially the weather and landscape to be seen on a kind of cosmic scale. So the energy was made back. Yeah, so that's what it. Ruskin saw was the energy yeah. in its uniqueness expressed in color form and, yeah. and uh, I, I would add to that in a more behavioral term. But at that point, we're talking about tension and, and danger and growth that is our vulnerability, that is our, our least perfect, our most human moment, is also one that's harmonious among all of us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what connects us, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever our, our art is, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the old argument of modern painters, which is that the landscape painters of the past were to, to reduce it to a cartoon, that were, were, were about order. The order of nature and what Turner could reveal to Ruskin was the energy of nature. Another term. Uh, the energy that nature is moving, changing. Uh, yeah. the, the other term you might use is pictorial. Mm -hmm. the atavism, what was the word? Pictorial. 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 Well, the picturesque. Yeah, yeah. The picturesque is, a, is a, I think, an antique show. Yeah. Pictorial yeah. or kind of cliche. Very sad. A set piece. Set piece, right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
in goes by Turner and Soul. It goes by the 20th century. Out of the blue, Mrs. Turner and Mrs. Platt had so long. Uh, yeah. American family that pays more for it than it's worth it. It's rusty. And today, it's very good. Value. Will you show it to this the audience? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So they've seen it and made a presentation. Right. In the past. But this, you can um, yeah. get it in, into the light. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm trying to get it right, it's hard. Uh, it's that good? That's good. Uh, yeah, sort of. Sort yeah. of. Yeah. Anyway. Well, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. my favorite quote is, if you contain the need, you contain the world. Oh, yes. And that is so inspired. Yeah, world. yeah. Yes. And, um, well, and, and, and to Elena's point about, uh, about you're talking about uh, uh, Hopkins. Yes. I think what what Russ is really saying, even to to people, his disciples, who are he's telling every rock, every stone in the building is a story. You have to capture the what he's about is thisness, the particular. You have to work to come to the place where you see the absolute individuality of everything. The line and sheer plow makes plow down city and shine. <laughs> Oh. Well, as yeah. Elaine is an actress, both stage and film, and so I think also that being an actress, that, that often in choosing um, a setting or a focus on the ordinary brings out the extraordinary. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is also a concept mm -hmm. that is definitely resting. Yeah. Well, I actually stayed at La Cantina in Vegas, mm. where Ruskin stayed. Mm. 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 Yeah. Just right there on the Grand Canal to listen to the water. And, and mm. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. That's quite right. Now, recently there's, there's a plaque there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's such a marvelous talk. I want to see it as a character. Are there any closing remarks that you'd like to make or um it's just been it's been absolutely lovely and I guess as ever, you know, we all we walk into a situation and and, and meet for the first time and this it's it's very moving to, you know, just in conversations through the day and the last few days to find find such kindred feeling. And I think that's one of the things its relationship it enables us to find the strength to think, well, how can I be most and next useful? So um mm. so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. It's been thank you for your experience. I'm reminded of the uh, remark that uh, uh, Rachel Rachel Dickinson, the master of the Guild of St. George in the UK made uh, about the previous master, Clive Wilmer, who was given a, uh, a tribute a number of weeks ago. And uh, she said at the end, it was just lovely, she said that, that the, the tenderness of the various tributes for Clive's work over the years, she said, we've become a family mm -hmm. <laughs> all over the world. It's, just, it's, it's like we're like a, this big, unruly, you know, family. Uh, and that's a, a wonderful, a wonderful development. Is that kind of heartfelt uh, reality? Is that the, the core of Ruskin's being? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What he lamented, he didn't see mm -hmm. more of. There we are. There we are. So, yes, so that's. Well. Oh, do, you have those? do you want to. Oh, yes. Yeah, so a couple, couple of. I always have last closing remarks. Um, the uh you have to sit oh yes yes okay um on the 28th of october uh at usc is their their annual um uh, archives bazaar uh, at the library where historic organizations of all sorts uh will be uh exhibiting treasures from their collections and uh, 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 that sort of thing. Well, for the first the first time, we will be there. So from 10 to 3 on the 28th, so we will have a, a, a table 
uh, at the bazaar. And uh, it's a lovely concept. The idea is that all these historic organizations, you know, be, uh, speak to us about the the, the the history of Los Angeles, about who the who we really are as a as a place. So it's a we're delighted to be to be a part of all that for the first time uh, this year on October twenty eighth. So visit us. We'll we'll be there and become a member of. Oh well, that's goes without saying. <laughs> goes without saying. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and then on um, November ninth, and then the eighteenth. Right. No, the eleventh and the eighteenth. Uh, we we always in November we always do a a, a, a very public uh, set of study sessions on a work of Ruskin, led by uh, someone who's. Uh, deeply familiar with that work. So this year, uh, our November study sessions will be on Ruskin's great essay, The Work of Iron, and Philip Moore, uh, uh, the author of Albert Whale, uh, will be uh, on board to lead us through uh, two, two sessions on uh, The Work of Iron. Uh, Robert Pinsky, the former poet laureate of the of the U.S. once characterized the work of, of iron as a great jazz rhythm. <laughs> because it just goes all over the map. But like a great jazz riff, always the underlying unity and always comes back home at the end. So it's a it's a marvelous, a marvelous journey. And we invite you to join us. Thank you. So. And and all of that's all of the, the details are all on, on our website, which we urge people to to use, take advantage of. It has all sorts of uh, of uh, resources about Ruskin, about the Ruskin Art Cloud. It has our YouTube channel, where all of our more than eighty programs are, and lectures and presentations are there for the public. So. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for coming tonight. And thank you for the Denverts for hosting us in these gracious precincts. We can have a little one. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Let me, uh, yeah, let me thank you all for coming tonight. See you. Talk to you later.